So, um, welcome ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for giving up part of your evening. My name is um, Richard Moorhead. I'm a professor here at UCL Faculty of Laws. Uh, and uh, uh, this event's um, hosted by the Centre for Ethics and Law and the faculty itself. Our dean is sitting over there and a very large number, an unusually large number of my colleagues are coming, which is great. Um, usually I can't get them to come to my events. <laughs> they don't seem interested for some reason. The, uh, I'm really delighted that we could host this event. I've been thinking about it for a uh, long time. Uh, the, uh, I first read about Zelda's story uh, way back in the mists of time, and I thought, gosh, this is a really brave woman. Uh, but I mainly thought, gosh, this is a really interesting story about the lawyers. And so I wrote about the lawyers, uh, as some of you will know. And I've been following the NDA story um, ever since. But what I've increasingly picked up from the stories is because sometimes other people who have been subject to or are subject to NDAs in sex harassment cases or other kinds of cases have also started to talk to me quite a lot. And they are um, almost to a person absolutely terrified, uh, absolutely terrified of uh, the power of the law and sometimes the behavior of the lawyers. So. What I wanted to do uh, in this event this evening is provide an opportunity for people like us, some of whom are lawyers, some of whom are students, some of whom are, I suspect, uh, subject to NDAs, some of whom are just generally interested and concerned about the issue, to hear from somebody like Zelda about her experiences and really start to understand how the way that lawyers behave can impact on the people they interact with in a, a real and tangible way. So that's why. I asked Zelda to come, and I'm really grateful to her for doing so. Um, I asked a number of my colleagues, my friends in the area, who should we get to do the conversation? I don't want to do it. I don't think that's probably the best way to do it. And to a person, <laughs> they said, Karen Monaghan. I said, I've never met Karen Monaghan. What's she like? And then they told me what she's like. I won't tell you what they said. <laughs> well, maybe over drinks, I will. Uh, uh, and Karen, to my delight, said, said yes straight away. Uh, Karen, as you know, is a QC, Matrix Chambers, and uh, does a lot of work in the quality discrimination, sexual harassment cases. Uh, the website doesn't, her website doesn't emphasize this, but if you look very carefully, one of the phrases that comes from something like Chambers is legal genius. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> and you have to pay extra for that bit. Did you? <laughs> I, they, those, those directories, they are a bit dubious. It's a bit like the, the entry scandal in the States. Uh, and, uh, uh, and they also say, and her clients really appreciate that she is on their side. She really empathizes with her clients. So uh, I'm delighted, Karen, that you can join us and Zelda. Thank you again. Uh, the format, probably about 40 minutes or so, they're going to talk to each other. Uh, and then after that, we will have a little bit of time for questions, which I'll, just for convenience, I'll chair. And then we'll break back up to the first floor for a, a reception, if any of you would like to join us for a more informal chat. So, Karen Zellner, over to you. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, Zelda. I've already said it's lovely to meet you, but I want to say it again, so I have. Me too. <laughs> um, uh, we've already had a long discussion, and as we've already said, we're frightened to death that we won't have anything else to say to each other, but I'm sure we will. Um, I thought it'd be interesting uh, just really to hear from you about the context. So something about your experiences with Weinstein, what happened, um, not necessarily all the detail, but really what happened, what led you eventually to take some action and what happened in consequence. And then maybe we can have a look um, or have a discussion later on about what's happened more recently. But perhaps looking back and saying something about your experiences, I think will be helpful, firstly, to locate the story, if you like, what happened, um, but also because I think it might give us an insight, if we need one, I suspect we don't, many of us don't, but an insight into how sexual harassment actually can happen in the workplace, how it plays out, how a culture can exist which makes it very difficult to challenge, and so on. So, do you want to kick off with that? Sure. Well, uh, I don't think I need to probably explain very many details about Weinstein's behaviour because they've been quite well publicised and he had a fairly um, small repertoire which sadly seemed to work quite effectively. 
Um, and ultimately, I think it was less to do with the repertoire, but it was to do with his power, which we all know. And he, he was an extreme case of power and ran his company in a very abusive way. And everybody was um, in a sort of coercive, abusive relationship with him. Um, like many of the women who started working at Miramax, I started very young, so I had no experience of working in a... You were 22 or something, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. I had no experience of working in an office, let alone a large corporation with a very powerful boss. Um, but I had had a very um, uh, middle-class upbringing and was fairly clear on, I thought, very clear on what was correct behaviour and wasn't correct behaviour. Um, any woman who worked with Weinstein, and I say this without any exception, was sexually harassed, and sexually harassed at, to a pretty um, strong degree. Um, and everybody dealt with it differently, I'm sure. Um, I dealt with it pretty robustly, mostly because I was very young, and I didn't, um, it, it, it didn't occur to me that this could ruin my life if I lost my job. You know, it was my first job. Um, anyway, as I'm sure you all know, uh, a co he assaulted a colleague of mine. And at that point, it really changed for me because I felt that I was in a position of putting somebody else in danger. You know, you can mm -hmm. deal with your own issues. Um, and I also didn't believe that he was capable of assault. I knew he was capable of inappropriate behaviour. And it was a serious assault? It was a, seri it was a serious assault. Um, and uh, I then did what I presumed was normal. And again, sadly, it's partly naivety that I say yeah. that I thought was normal, because clearly it didn't happen very often, but I went to him straight away, um, which was clearly met with a, a, a denial, um, and a denial that I knew wasn't true. Um, and... My colleague and I, essentially, we resigned and, again, followed what we thought would be a normal process of reaching some form of justice. Uh, we didn't have an HR department where we worked. And I say that because I think most people now, particularly in this environment, all presume that, well, you'd go to your HR person and maybe they'd sort it out. Um, but even if there had been an HR department, and I'd like to stress this, it wouldn't have made any difference. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a a powerful, abusive uh, figure in a, in a, who's running a company, you know, HR belonged to them too. Um, and, you know, it's a process yeah. that can be marred. So what did you do after you resigned? No HR department? <laughs> I went to the Citizens Advice Bureau. <laughs> was my yeah. first step, because I really didn't know what else to do. Mm. With, also, with the other person or just separately. I just made a phone call yeah um, and I did also go to my only female senior who just told me I needed a lawyer uh, which was the beginning of of really the for me personally the journey of real abuse yeah. that it felt like for me or disabuse of my beliefs in our culture um, so I found a lawyer who was basically across the street from where we worked because that was what I thought you did. And so you just found it knocked on the door, essentially. Pretty just much. Like, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I looked for a media lawyer in the vicinity. Um, or a media lawyer. I looked for a lawyer in the vicinity. In the vicinity. Because um, the only lawyers that I'd had any contact with at all were media lawyers who worked for Miramax. Um, so I, obviously I couldn't approach yeah. them. And very straight away, my colleague and I were, it was made pretty clear that we were optionless, which I found... The lawyer told you that? We were given that impression, absolutely, because... We, the, the assault happened in, in Venice, so we were out of jurisdiction in terms of police. Um, we also had no proof. Um, a little bit of time had passed, not that much, but a little bit of time had passed, like maybe three weeks, two, three weeks, um, which I think when you've got two young people who are 
traumatised and not knowing what to it's do. It's not very long at all. It's not yep. very long. We were also abroad and, you know, didn't come back. Um, but it was presented to us that our, our only realistic option was settlement because we couldn't go to court because it would just be our word against his. And again, I say, you know, I, I feel like it was naive, but I genuinely believed that as an employee reporting a criminal offence to a person who represented the law to me, um, that that would set off a, a string of consequences that would lead to justice. I didn't expect my first hurdle to be trying to... To be the lawyer. Yeah, or to have to, or, ha or to have to find another way of finding justice. Did, did they discuss? Did you discuss uh, bringing a sex discrimination claim, sexual harassment I didn't discrimination? Didn't know about sex dis right. I mean, so it was just I no, going. I had no, I, I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, you have to imagine. My colleague had been there, been with us for three months. It was about the second or third time that she'd even been in Weinstein's presence. I had been working there for two and a half, three years. I had never had a uh, sort of induction into what rights I had as an employee. I knew nothing about sex discrimination. And again, we're looking at 20 yeah. years ago, there was a lot less understanding. And not just for juniors, I think even senior um, Women, yeah. executives and companies didn't really have the language that we have now. So you go in, see the lawyer, and they just say, well, you're going to settle and it, you're not going to be able to prove anything else. So there you are. That, that was pretty much it, yeah. Right. And uh, uh, we were very, very adamant that settlement was not an option that we wanted. We didn't want money. This, I mean, and it was, it was shocking to me that my, they brought up the, you know, mm. the concept of money. I didn't even know that that was a part of it. Possibility, yeah. Yeah, that, that was a possibility. Um, and I think that was shocking too, because this was clearly to them, this was quite a normal process. Um... And we kept asking for options, and ultimately there weren't any options. Tribunal was probably discu discussed. I don't remember because it ended up not being an option. Um, and again, for the reasons I think I gave earlier, that it would be two junior employees' words against Miramax and essentially the Disney Corporation. Um, and we, we had no power in that situation. Um, so you came to negotiate an agreement. We well, when I say negotiate, that's probably overstating well, it. Well, I think what, you came what, to enter yes, an agreement. Yes. What happened at that point is we, our choice was to try. Our only desire was to stop Weinstein's behaviour, which again I think was a pretty reasonable, yep, reasonable situation, reasonable ask. And but we had to lead the fight, and it was a fight even with our own team, essentially, to create an agreement that was kind of quid pro quo, that was as complicated and difficult for Weinstein as it was for us. So we put in, we, we demanded obligations from him that we hoped would stop his behaviour, bringing in some form of counselling protection for, for, Wasn't there? for employees, yeah. that he had to go to a psychiatrist that I had to go to that first session with him so that he couldn't pretend it was about smoking or, yeah. you know, being addicted to video games. Um, uh, that if he made a further settlement in the ensuing years, two or three years, that Miramax had to either declare that to Disney or he would be fired. Now, those clauses were all put in the agreement, and if that's not an admission of guilt, I don't really know what is. So as far as I was concerned, we had our lawyers and we had his lawyers both working on an agreement that essentially was confirming our accusation. Yeah. Now, to me, that's clearly an ethical issue hmm. that we're still debating now in How great How was detail. the process, just, I mean, can you say something about the process of actually coming to that agreement. So there were things, as you've said, and we can come back to, back, back to this, but there were things in the agreement which were designed to address his behaviour, like you say, going to see a psychiatrist, disclosing, any, uh, disclosing the agreement in the event of any further agreement and so on. Um, but 
Can you describe the process of having to go, th go through the agreement and come to terms? Was there any sense of power in that context? Did you feel it was a any very... degree of autonomy? And... <laughs> no, I mean, it was a very intimidating process for two young women. Um, we worked in media. We only dealt with people in sort of jeans and trainers, and suddenly we're in a you know, high-rise office in the city, always in the, always in the evening, in the dark, with several people in suits, um, being, being grilled and being made to feel like we, we were doing something wrong. Was, was this your lawyers or their lawyers? Their lawyers, but, you know, in a combined situation, we were, it felt like we were under siege, and our lawyers were under siege too. Um, and, I mean, you all know it is legal process to use forms of, in, of intimidation, whether that's hurrying things along, not giving people a lot of time to make up their mind about things. Um, but the behaviour, it wasn't, we didn't have people sort of shouting at us, but the behaviour was intimidating and, um, and very confusing for two people not versed in any form of, of legal speak. So you entered into the agreement. Um, and it was um, obviously a non-disclosure agreement, as we know. Mm. So, so far as you were aware, from your perspective, what were you able to say about the agreement, if anything? Nothing. We weren't allowed to... Were you allowed to say that you had entered into an no. agreement? We, we weren't even really allowed to talk about our time at Miramax. We were allowed to refer to the fact that we'd worked there, but we weren't allowed to discuss our time at Miramax. We certainly weren't allowed to to discuss the fact that we'd entered into any form of agreement. We weren't allowed to discuss any of the things that had happened to us even... Well, we were allowed to discuss them with a medical practitioner or a financial advisor, but we were not allowed to do that unless they also signed a confidentiality agreement, which we were then responsible for. So if they had broken their confidence, their confidentiality agreement, we would have been held responsible by the Weinstein team. So it would have been our material breach, not theirs. And in terms of the, um, who you were able to report the agreement to or, or speak to the agreement about, so for example, in the context of legal proceedings, um, I think there were some uh, conditions in the agreement that made clear that you were to use your best endeavours, I think it might have been described as, use your best endeavours not to disclose the events, even in the context of it's other criminal legal proceedings. Yeah. Um, so in the context of a criminal case or a civil case, they, were, they couldn't prevent you from discussing what happened in that context. No. But there was, a, I think, a best endeavours clause, don't say anything, but you don't have to. Yes, and ultimately the impression that we walked away with, and I'm using impression now as a sort of slightly sanitising hindsight word. When we left those offices, we felt that we couldn't speak to anybody, including the police or, you know, a doctor or a friend or a member of our family or a therapist or the HMRC. In fact, I have a side letter which says I'm not allowed to discuss it with the HMRC. I have to direct HMRC to Alan and Overy. They were the solicitors for Weinstein. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in terms of how that made you feel, did how did you feel? Was that? A, I mean, it sounds like a very stressful experience. Who am I? How can I speak about this? Will I get in trouble? What What did you think the implications of outing yourself might be at that stage? That we'd go to jail. I oh, mean, yeah. I genuinely thought that I'd go. I'd I'd be sued for the money back, and that I'd probably end up going to jail. And I know that sounds silly. And, you know, I have since discovered that a lot of the clauses in the agreement were unenforceable. And um, I'm not suggesting that our lawyers told us we would go to jail, but that was absolutely how it felt. Right. That we would have, would have had the wrath of Weinstein, Disney, the lawyers, everybody, because we had signed away our rights. That's what it felt like. Right. Um, I mean, I suppose... But I'd like to say, yeah. because I know people's arguments always, well, you signed it for, for money. We signed it for an assurance that Weinstein's yeah. behaviour was going to be stopped. And do you know what happened in terms of the obligations that he signed up to, the going to see a psychiatrist, the reporting to Disney if it happened, there was another agreement and so on? Not really, no. No. Um, 
so just in terms then of uh, your experience with your lawyers, I'm not asking you to criticise the lawyers, of course. It's, I mean, we can <laughs> criticise the lawyers, but in terms of the particular lawyers, um, you get the sense that you're left... I, I, I get the sense that you were left after that experience being very unclear about, first of all, what was binding, mm -hmm. what, what, what they could enforce, and what the consequences to you might be well, we were if very, you spoke about it. Yes, well, one of the most horrifying clauses, which again, at the time, it, our lawyers and, and Weinstein's lawyers put it in the contract, so we presumed it was allowed, but we, the two you, you know, victims of the situation, were not allowed to hold a copy of our own mm. non-disclosure agreement. So we couldn't even check on our own obligations, which ultimately means that basically you just can't ever, ever say anything. Because you're not sure whether or not it might breach the no. agreement. You've got a copy of the agreement now. I have now, but I only got it in July last year. And I would... And how many years are we talking about in the 20, 20 Well, 21, 22 now nearly. Um, and I presumed when all of this started, when Weinstein was exposed and I broke the agreement, I presumed once I broke it, I would be allowed to have it. <laughs> That's one way of getting it, isn't it, you'd think? Well, you'd think. But no, I wasn't allowed to have it. And even though a parliamentary committee requested it, it was still not forthcoming. Do you have a copy of the whole agreement now? I have a copy of the whole agreement now by a marvellous thing called a oh, yes. data subject access request. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> which is my new favourite thing yeah. and I think is a hugely empowering yeah. piece of information because Select Committee Inquiry could not get my agreement. The only way I could get my agreement, and I'm, weirdly I'm still in this position over some other documents held by um, my legal, my past lawyers, is by going to court to receive my own legal I think, documents. I think you're not able to get your, your own file even now, is that right? Mm-hmm. I'm still fighting that currently, and I think we were talking about this. For me, this is a very important illustration of how the law is being abused and is being used as a tool in the wrong way. You know, the agreement, I've been released from the agreement. The, the Weinstein Company announced that all Weinstein um, uh, NDA holders were released from their agreements. Uh, I participated in a documentary which received a response from Weinstein saying that I should make my agreement public. However, the lawyers who were holding my agreement, who looked after me at the time, still, because of process, are not allowed to give me, apparently, my own documents or my colleague. So just, can you just tell us what happened? So they're abusing us, not Weinstein at this point. Yeah. Um, can you just tell us then, just getting to that stage then, so um, you spoke after, the, after Weinstein was exposed, uh, you decided to out yourself, so to speak, and say what had happened. Um, what was that experience like? Were you frightened? Were you concerned? Did you have support? <clears throat> Did you get a lawyer? <laughs> it's a lot of questions and a lot of answers. Um, Once it became apparent that Weinstein was a serial offender, which at that point I was not, you know, I was not aware in 2017. Bad? I don't think anybody was aware. Nobody was aware that it was that bad. It became obvious to me that I had a moral duty to break my agreement. And I presumed that public interest, and I didn't even know it in those terms, because that's a legal term, but I didn't know it in that term. I believed that public interest would... Protect me you. safe, would yeah. protect me, because I believed it was my moral duty. <clears throat> and I also believed that there was no way that a legal document would still be valid when it was clear that it was protecting a criminal. However, it wasn't quite that simple. I asked advice um, on breaking my agreement, and I was given pretty clear advice that that was not possible. Was that from the same solicitors that you initially instructed? Mm -hmm. or? Mm -hmm. Um, and I understand that that is the advice that they had to give me. Um, 
my biggest concern breaking the agreement, again, was not actually Weinstein coming after me. I was more concerned that I would be in legal trouble or that I would be in trouble for defamation of uh, one of the law firms involved. And genuinely, the, that entire process, my fear was about legal recriminations, not Weinstein recriminations. And again, I think that speaks quite um, powerfully about the power of these agreements. Did you, did you just look, thinking, I'm not, I'm not asking you to say anything critical about the lawyers in particular, but did you feel that the, the lawyers generally were able to provide you with support, or was it just, you've signed this agreement, say nothing? Well, there wasn't, what do you mean generally? Well, you're, at you're this, at this, yeah, I mean, well, now? presently. No, presently, I mean, and again, I'm talking to people who understand law and process is, takes over, rather. Um, and, I mean, one of the things that I was saying to you earlier is that my, what I've really came away from this experience, and I still feel, is that the experience I've had with, this, with solicitors throughout this is that there is a real problem in the balance between a solicitor's duty to the solicitor, mm -hmm. uh, to, to the court and to justice, and and to their client, and to a contract. You know, and a lot of solicitors become caught in the process of contract and in protecting a wealthy and powerful client rather than acting independently and ethically. That's and, what it feels and like. And prioritising justice. And prioritising justice. Um, I know in consequence of that, because you've expressed this and we've already discussed it, that you have very clear views about NDAs. Um, and can you tell us what they are? Well, they've developed. I mean, I've learned a lot and I've had gone through a whole new legal process and not always positive process in the last 18 months. And originally when this happened, I, and I still understand that there is a place for non-disclosure agreements that are agreements made in the correct form, which is to protect IP yeah. or, or trade, you know, trade secrets in an appropriate manner. Um, I have a huge problem, or not a problem, I, I'm very conflicted about the argument in terms of NDAs being used in cases of abuse or discrimination. Because I know, having spoken to a lot of very erudite um, lawyers, that it's often the victim needs that protection or wants that protection. But from this process and from a lot of the evidence that I've been hearing and watching in the Select Committee inquiry, which there's a secondary one now dealing with NDA specifically used with, uh, in discrimina discrimination, I really believe there is no place for a non-disclosure agreement when there is abuse, discrimination, inappropriate behaviour, potential criminal behaviour. I shouldn't have to say that, but I do. Mm. Um, and what I was saying to you earlier is, is that when you look at it from a larger scale, yes, it does mean that there's going to be a very uncomfortable period where some victims may not feel that they can come forward because they don't have that option. However, this is a massive cultural problem and culture isn't going to change immediately. But to make culture change, we've got to be brave. And there are always people who lose, and there are people losing currently who shouldn't be losing. But until that option is not there for the perpetrator or the victim, you know, the statistics are not going to change. So we've had that discussion, as you've said, the, the person who will only come forward if she thinks she can have a non-disclosure agreement, so her privacy is protected, or identity is protected, non-disparagement clauses, maybe mutual non-disparagement clauses, as we were discussing, so as to protect her against any adverse comment. Um, but from your experience, that isn't enough to outweigh the greater public interest in stopping the sorts of covering up. Yeah that you've described to us? I mean, again, there are lots of ways of making NDAs better, of having a trans more transparent system. Um, but as, you, uh, as we were saying, as you look at more and more individual cases, it becomes complex. And so ultimately, and 
And I'm very happy for people to sh shout me down about it because the most important thing is, is that the conversation yeah. will, get, will happen. Yeah. And if I take the more extreme view, then hopefully we'll get closer to that view. Yeah. But I honestly cannot see how we can move forward properly well, we've got if you can have legal protect if you can have a legal document that protects abusive behavior yeah i think one thing i, I think the suggestion came from you um was that ndas should be at least recorded so there should be some transparency about the fact of an nda so a company or an organization must be required to report its existence and its annual yeah. report or something of that like that even if yes. the contents of it yeah. are not I mean, there disclosed. are so many shocking elements to NDAs. The fact that settlement money paid out to victims is not audited. That money is shareholders' money. It's taxpayers' money. Oh. You know, I, I mean, it's nonsensical that this is happening. That this oh. is happening. And okay, maybe, maybe for the next ten years, we're going to have a better form of NDA. There'll be true transparency. You know, people will be able to see if there is a pattern of a particular person who is who is being abusive within a company. But, but ultimately, again, when you talk about it like that, you're talking about big, responsible corporations. Mm. Now, if you're talking about a small business or um, in a more independent environment, having those safeguards aren't mm. necessarily going to help. Yeah. Um, so the role of the lawyers, you've already said that that was uh, difficult. Um, uh, and I think you've expressed some views about that, about the responsibility of lawyers. Well, you've already touched upon it briefly, that actually uh, you think that the lawyers, certainly in your experience, sometimes elevated the interests of their clients above their broader ethical responsibilities. Yes, and I'm not, and I'm not trying to lawyer bash. I understand that they're doing a job, that they have a process, um, but... You know, this is another reason why I think it's so important that, that it's, it's the legal environment and the legal behaviour that is looked at. Because solicitors need help too. They need to have clear guidelines. And I'm afraid the SRA's guidelines are not clear enough. And they can mm -hmm. keep publishing their warning notice, yeah. their guidance notice, but it's not going to make any difference because the guidance notice, the handbook has not changed. It's the same handbook that was there 20 years ago. I know there are different whistleblowing laws now, but actually, unless there are very, very clear guidelines that it, so that a solicitor knows that they cannot negotiate an agreement... That covers up crime, that covers for up example. wrongdoing. Yeah, or crime, but serious well, particularly wrongdoing. particularly crime. Yeah. You wouldn't yeah. think that you would have to make that obvious. I mean, the government's uh, press release on Monday suggesting that they're going to propose that these agreements can't have clauses that stop people going to the police. I mean, well, well everybody one, on the street would presume that's the case already. Yeah, yeah. You it's know, so remarkable that it, 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 it is the government could assume that that was lawful in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it, as I say, it's interesting. We've had this discussion uh, outside, as we've, as we've said, that from my perspective, as a lawyer who represents women who've experienced sexual harassment, not just women who've experienced sexual harassment, but sometimes racial harassment, not always in the employment sphere, there is often a desire to keep that quiet. And I understand Because that. of the impact on careers. Mm -hmm. um, and although we ought to think there won't be an impact on careers, we know there is. Um, and but it, the impact should be on the perpetrator's yeah, career. Yeah. They're always looking down the wrong end of the telescope. Yeah. And again, I know it's very easy to make these sweeping statements, but actually until you're brave and you change the socio-cultural view... Then we'll always get it the wrong way around. We're always going to get it the wrong way around. Yeah. And by, you know, by making it clearer for, for legal representatives and for making it clearer, having better corporate governance, having better employment law you know it's not it's not one thing yeah i mean one of the other things that's um uh perhaps paradoxically i don't know um but the other one of the other things that's emerged in the legal profession that has affected some of us is that we are now subject to a duty to disclose so not only um uh, is the idea of entering non-disclosure agreements resisted but as a barrister if somebody reports to you that they've been subject to sexual harassment, 
then our professional rules require us to disclose to the regulatory body, the Bar Standards Board, which means, and I know this from experience, if a young woman says to you, I'm being sexually harassed by X, I don't want you to tell anybody, but I want you to help me in managing that, then we are under a professional obligation to report. Um, and so, you know, there's a... Um, so do you, do you, this links to... to well, it's, it's an interesting, uh, it's sort of how does, how do we... Is that having a dampening effect well, on people coming to Well, it, it hasn't, regrettably. They still come, and I still have to face the prospect of, you know... Um, no, I shouldn't say regrettably, I don't mean that. But, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it creates that difficulty. But, or, or, I'm, I'm simply saying that, the, of course, we all want disclosure, we want reports... We want people to be disciplined. Indeed, we want them to be disbarred if misconduct's established. But the reality is, it's a bit like the reality with non-disclosure agreements, is that it can have an effect of silencing women. Yep. Um, because if they think, well, however nice she is, she is going to be under a professional obligation to report this, and I will therefore find myself the subject of an investigation. Um, or in the case of a, uh, you know, somebody you're representing in a tribunal, um, I want this, Karen, I want this. Uh, you know, you may think justice is better served by me bringing an employment tribunal case. Well, and there's I, an argument for victim-led non-disclosure agreements. Yeah, we had that, didn't we? Could you have a victim-led <laughs> Sorry, everybody, one? <laughs> Sorry, we've had about <laughs> what we've been talking about. But, I mean, yeah. there, is, there, is, there is an argument for that. And again... I'm not, I don't have the answers. Yeah. And, um, but these are interesting discussions. They're points. very interesting discussions and I think they're very important. And in fact, um, Richard was at, at the, recently at, uh, giving evidence at the Select Committee inquiry and I believe the BBC and I can't remember what other company, but have now stopped the use mm. of NDAs. And interestingly, they are not seeing this having a dampening effect. Because I think people feel that they are in a safe environment. Well, that's interesting. And that's, that's yeah. what it's about. It's yeah. about changing the environment. And it's about changing the environment for lawyers too, yeah. so that they can make the right decisions easily. And, and perhaps we are, the, the culture we've come from, or I've come from, means it's that I'm less resistant to it. Perhaps exactly. I should be more well, robust exactly. with my clients that, that, and saying, yes. look, this is something you need to think about yeah. more carefully rather than thinking, well, okay, let's go for an here's NDA. A, here's a yeah. question for you. Why have the bar standards decided not to, to publish any guidance at this point, where the SRA and the Law Society have. Yeah. That's quite odd. Well, they've, they've, they've produced very little guidance about anything. I mean, even their, <laughs> even their guidance on disclosing sexual harassment complaints, because the guidance that says you're required to disclose sexual harassment uh, reports, even if you're being approached to support somebody who doesn't want disclosure, they've now produced another piece of guidance which says, well, you still have to report, but we're making a special exception uh, by way of a pilot scheme. So if you're part of this pilot project, and I don't know who is part of the pilot project, <laughs> and you've had the requisite training, you can be a person to whom a report is made, um, and the fact that you don't report, the fact that you've had a report, doesn't necessarily mean you'll be disciplined, which is ludicrous, because yeah. women don't you know, ring up the bar council and say... Can you find me a person who's done your, who's on your panel and on your pilot and has un undergone the requisite chain? You know, they go up the room and yeah. find somebody friendly to speak to. But yeah, so it's probably. I mean, we, and it, I, as I say, it's perhaps the culture in which we work means that we're not challenging enough. We've we've worked, and I, and I grown up in that yeah. environment, and so see it as an easy route. And I think that's clear too when you look since this whole investigation into non-disclosure agreements has come into the public arena, you know, some of the companies with biggest problems are the law firms. Mm. And I don't think that's because it's worse in law firms. I just think that nobody really knew how bad it was. Yeah. And I don't think the left hand was speaking to the right hand. I don't think everyone knew within their companies what was going on because there's no transparency. It can be done, it's all done secretly. Mm. I mean, it is, it, it's power being used wrongly and the law is being used to, to to, you know, put a full stop by yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing um, we're seeing as well, um, increasingly, and we discussed this briefly as well, is the use of defamation proceedings or threats of defamation to silence women. 
Um, I don't know if you've had any, I think, well, you, you, you were raising with me the fear that you had that even discussing this, which could conceivably implicate somebody or another, that that might, that you, there was an anxiety about that. What could you discuss? Would there be any, where were the lines drawn and so on because of the fear, not that it's been threatened, but the, the perception that you are vulnerable yourself, even absent the agreement, to defamation proceedings if you say something which might suggest some criticism of somebody or another. Yes, and, and you know, I still feel slightly under the yeah. fear of that in, in terms of talking about the, the legal situation I'm in now. And it's funny because I sort of feel on one hand it's not realistic and on the other hand it is very realistic. Um, and I have tried to be pretty impeccable with my language I, I think I'm less impeccable now because... But you're still quite cautious, I nobody, think. Nobody's, you know, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yes, I am still quite cautious. Uh, and I understand that I don't have a, 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 a legal understanding of the process that, you know, my past solicitors are going through. But what I do think is important is, is that everybody understands how damaging that process yeah. still is. Yeah. And so you guys can go and work out how to make it better. Because <laughs> I'm Well, we're part of the problem, I think. That's <laughs> well, exactly. But that's yeah. what I'm saying. You know, I'm not... It, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem on so, on so many different, different levels. But from the very simplest form, as a young person or, you know, somebody with very little power, when you go to a legal body... We hold them in high esteem. We look at lawyers like they are... You and trust them. Yes, you trust them and you believe they've got all this mysterious knowledge that you could never possibly have. And actually, a young woman uh, came and asked me after a, a similar event to this, what advice would you give somebody in this situation now? And I'm afraid I said, don't believe your fucking lawyer. <laughs> don't believe everything they say. You need to question everything, mm -hmm. because we all, we, you know, us lay people are in are in thrall of the law, and I still have a sort of reverence to the law, and I presume that the law is there to protect me, protect us from ourselves. But you also have an anxiety about it. I have a huge anxiety. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's 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 even somebody like you, who's this is now twenty years ago, or however long it is. Yeah. And you're, a, yeah, and, you know, and, you're, you've, you know you've 18 months ago when I broke my agreement and I tried to find a lawyer who would represent me, I was stonewalled. Nobody would take me on because guess what? Nearly every firm I went to creates these agreements and I was currently busting one of their really lucrative forms of, easy, of e making easy money because I was proving that they're not enforceable. Mm. And I know I'm in a lucky position because I, you know, it's not, I can't say to every woman, rip it up, come out, you know, I know that I'm in a unique position in that way mm -hmm. because of the current environment, because of Time's Up, because Weinstein is the, the ogre that has, has been, you know, exposed. exposed. And that's what's protecting me. It's not the law that's protecting me because I'm still breaking my agreement. I'm still doing everything wrong, apparently. Mm-hmm. <laughs>